that first one was a false start. <laughs> We're ready to get started. We're happy to have you here. I sound kind of loud. So, um, we are ready for the national anthem. Deanne is going to lead us today. And Cal, um, Mr. Lester said that he is going to um, not be here for a few weeks because of COVID. And Deanne has stepped up and she's going to have to so Let's have our national anthem. You know what you got to do. So, <laughs> how do you start? <laughs> such as the floods, the hurricanes, the fires, the Afghan situation. We pray for your guidance. We pray for your wisdom. And we pray for your patience because all of these things will come to fruition in the end. We ask that you bless this food, dry nourishment, and us to your service. That's it in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Catherine is going to be the presenter today. She's going to be a family of Rotary and introduction. All right, let's talk about birthdays and upcoming anniversaries. So for birthdays, we have Adam Williams, September the 2nd, Greg Hendricks, September the 3rd, Rosemary McKibben, September the 4th, Chris Pruitt, September the 5th, Jerry Atkinson, September the 5th as well, and Cal Whaley, September the 9th. And for anniversaries, we have Donna, Tomley, and Jeff, August the 31st, Joseph, Johnson, and Hope, September the 6th. Yeah. All right, and now for guests. We are happy to welcome our guests and visiting Rotarians today. When I call your name, would you please stand and remain standing until all visitors are recognized? We have Chris Judah, guest of Wayne Palmer. We have Philip Metcalf, guest of the club. We have Steve Dubell, guest of Mike Azar. And we have Adam Williams, guest of the Outlaw Club. All right, are there any other visitors we may have missed? All right, if you'll just give a round of applause to our guests. <laughs> Thank 
Yeah, we have a special announcement now. Josh and uh, Mr. Metcalf, 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 there at your table, you probably have a list of events we have planned for that day. Starts with bike ride that morning at 7 a.m. Then the gates open at noon. We're doing a $25 ticket. Uh, first responders, all first responders get a uh, ticket free. So they buy one, get one free. Um, we're also doing some tailgating and gonna have some bands. I'm gonna let Josh talk about that. Yeah. Uh, before I talk about specifics, I did wanna say a huge thank you. I reached out to many of you about sponsoring this event. Uh, and have had great feedback and want to say thank you, Dozen Rotary, for uh, supporting John Jam. Um, as for the day of the event, uh, Phil alluded to some tailgating. Um, instead, usually we have a chili cook-off for John Jam. This year, due to COVID and everything, we pushed it back to the fall instead of having it in the spring, and it's going to be tailgate thing. We'll have football going on, uh, so we'll have a tailgating competition. Uh, so any of you, there's still plenty of time to sign up a tailgating uh, cooking team. Uh, so any of you who are business owners and, and want to uh, um, to have your employees have a team, uh, please uh, let me know. And uh, like I mentioned, uh, we're, we're still encouraging people to, to sponsor uh, the event. We still have two weeks until the event. So uh, any last minute sponsors are certainly encouraged. Um, uh, this is the first year that the Outlaw Club has has been a part of John Jam, so we we really enjoyed uh, getting getting to work with these guys who've been doing it for for many years, and uh, it's been great to see a lot of the Outlaw Club uh, step up and really take ownership um, of certain subcommittees. Um, so uh, you know, a piece of Dozen Rotary Club uh, is really helping and continuing this event and uh, hopefully make it a success this year. Um, let's see, there's a, um, continuing with John Jam, there is um, uh, every year there's bands uh, that play. This year we have three bands, uh, two local bands, Los Locos and Glory Days will be playing. And then our, uh, our, our main band there that evening is Long Leaf Drive. Uh, they're out of like the 30A area. Uh, so we're looking forward to hosting them. Um, yeah, um, also, I just wanted to remind everyone that all, all uh, profit, all proceeds from this event uh, go to the real project here at WRC and also uh, purchase Ambux bicycles. Uh, it's also a program through WRC uh, for special needs kids. So uh, we ask that uh, you, you continue to support John Jam in any way that you can. Thank you. I didn't want to say for all the football fans out there, but we're going to have uh, all the games streamed live on big screens out there. So if you're here, you're going to team, we'll be streaming live that day. And what Josh said, the outlaw guys, they came and partnered with us this year, but it hadn't been for them. I don't know if John Jim would have kept going or not. So they really stepped in and took a, a major role in this. And I really appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Thank you. September 11th. Great job. Right. And so next week is Labor Day. We will not meet next week. So it'll be the following Saturday that John Jim takes place. All right. And August is membership month with the focus on membership, but um, really it's all year long. So it's, this is our last meeting in August. Uh, we're, we'll talk about that every week, but be thinking about who you would like to have, who you would like to uh, join you at Rotary, help you with the service projects that we do, and just um, always be thinking about who you'd like to invite and who would be a good fit for our club. All right, Josh, if you could introduce our speaker. Uh, we're happy to have Mr. William Holman with us today to present. Uh, William Holman serves as the executive director of the Dothan Area Botanical Gardens. 
Uh, he came to the gardens two and a half years ago after 34 years of service to Landmark Park. He served as executive director of the park for over 30 years. William is a native of Dothan, graduated from Dothan High School, and holds a degree in history from Auburn University. After leaving Auburn, he earned a master's degree in environmental education while a student of the National Audubon, Audubon Society Expedition Institute. This unique two-year outdoor learning program led him across the country, learning about the outdoors while camping, backpacking, canoeing, and hiking in a variety of outdoor environments. He slept on the ground in a sleeping bag for 18 months and says his back still hurts. <laughs> William is also a graduate of the Seminar for Historic Preservation, an intensive month-long training program held at Colonial Williamsburg in Virginia. William is married to the former Tammy Atkinson of, of Dothan, and they have two grown daughters, Anna and Caroline. If you will, please help me uh, welcome William Holden. appreciate the invitation to come speak, and I'm going to talk a little bit about Landmark Park, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the Botanical Gardens. If I slip the word Landmark Park in there, excuse me, but after 34 years, I still have some problems. Um, but I know you, you know a lot about Landmark Park. I know you know a lot about the Botanical Gardens, uh, and I want to show you some images of what's going on out there, some of the changes that we've made lately and also some of the new things that we have on the horizon. Um, I wanted to, first of all, before I go too far, is recognize I've got a couple of board members here. Uh, Vince Lingler and Bo Taggart are, are here. They're board members. Also, our former, some former board members, Sam Casey and Paul Angelo. Uh, Paul especially did a lot of the heavy lifting for what we recognize as the most. But I appreciate the board having confidence in me to lead this project. Of course, everybody knows where we are. We're on <coughs> Headland Avenue. We are adjacent to Landmark Park. We share a common property line. Uh, one of the things that amazes me, and I was next door for 34 years, but I didn't realize what all has happened in this place. So when I came, I was really amazed at, at what had been done and primarily by volunteers. And we took a basically a farmer's field and changed it into a beautiful place. One of the Basically, the, the gardens took a farmer's field and turned it into what we know today as the botanical garden. And when I first got to the garden, one of the things I did was I looked through the scrapbook, I looked through board minutes, and one of the interviews in the scrapbook was with A.C. Allen, who I'm sure you all remember. And he, when we started, he was out there bush hogging on a tractor, and cutting down weeds and that kind of thing. And, Basically, the young girl from the Dothan Eagle was talking to him, and she said that he pushed his hat back on his head, and pulled out his handkerchief, and wiped the sweat off his, off his forehead and said, Ma'am, you may not believe it, but one day we're going to have something beautiful. So it, it has taken people like that, people with a vision as to what you can do with a field and an idea and dedication. So um, really, the way I like to think about it is that the garden is a great representation of our community. And it shows what people can do when they believe in it. And it's, it's, you know, it's built by volunteers primarily. Today we have about, with last, this last year, even though we were closed, or the, the botanical center was closed for three months, we still had visitors in a nine month period from 44 states. And so they come from all over the country and we had about 23,000 visitors just within that, that nine month period. 
And as you know, the garden is made up of several, what we call pocket gardens that are all linked together through a paved walkway. We have the Asian garden, which you can see has the koi pond and the bridge. And this has almost become, almost become an iconic um, view of the garden. That's what people uh, think of many times when they see, see that. We also have azalea gardens. We have, I can't show all the different gardens that we have, but um, you know these azaleas are what you have in your home, what we call evergreen azaleas. But we also have a growing collection of native azaleas. And these are the azaleas that were always here. Uh, the azaleas that you have in your yard were imported. Uh, they came from Asia about the 1830s or so to the U.S. But native azaleas have been here the whole time. They're just not as popular, not as easy to get, uh, but they are beautiful. And we have a growing collection. Uh, many of the old timers will say, that's not a native azalea, that's a wild honeysuckle. And you can see that the blossoms are very similar to, to a honeysuckle blossom, but it is a native azalea. Many of them are fragrant. Um, many of them are deciduous. They'll flower before the leaves come on. Uh, and we do have, by the way, I'm going to give a little commercial. We do have an azalea sale, native azalea sale, an online sale that starts September the 1st. So if you'd like to order azaleas, you can go online to our website. Uh, members of the garden can start purchasing September the 1st. General public can purchase starting September the 6th. But uh, we have, we've got quite a selection, over a dozen different native azaleas that you can pick from. And uh, we're working with the Azalea Dogwood Festival on this, and we'll be splitting the proceeds and working together on this as a project. But um, if you'd like to, you can join. If, if you're not a current member, you can join so you can get early shopping. Uh, we have a beautiful, beautiful rose garden, which I'm sure a lot of you have seen. And when I first got to the garden, some of the Rose Society members came up to me and said, now, William, you know, we've got one of the best rose gardens in the Southeast. And I was kind of, <clears throat> okay, I know you're proud. I, you know, <laughs> I, I appreciate your uh, interest in that. But we had a rose show not long after that. And all of the out-of-town judges came to me and said, William, they're not kidding. Y'all have one of the best rose gardens in several states. So um, I encourage you to, to come out. Uh, we could not have it without the Wiregrass Rose Society. And um, anyway, it is a sight to behold when it's in full bloom. So about mid, mid May or so, um, I encourage you to come out and take a look. If you've never seen 350 something roses blooming at once, it's, it's worth, worth the trip. Of course, we also have a tropical house, the Coleman Tropical House that we're proud of. It has inside plants that you don't find here normally, plants from the tropics. And the, also the demonstration garden, many of the gardens we have have been adopted, thanks, thankfully. Uh, this is adopted by the Wiregrass um, Master Gardeners. And this little garden, there's about 18 raised beds there. And we grow vegetables um, just to show people as, as a demonstration. And all that goes to David at the food bank. And believe it or not, that little plot of land over the last 25 years has raised over 27,000 pounds of food for the food bank. So we're, we're proud of that. Uh, our daily garden is um, also beautiful. It has over 300 different types of daylilies. And it was recently awarded a status from the National or the American uh, Daylily Society, and it's called a, an official display garden. And that means that it meets certain criteria. And there's only 300 of these in North America. And so we've got one of them right here. At Hope. So we're now listed in all the daylily publications and, and that kind of thing. You know, several things that, that I had not really thought about until recently is on the back side of the property, of course, you can see the paved walkway. Um, 
And to us, or to many of us, it just looks undeveloped. And we had a couple in from New York recently, and you could tell they were outdoors and they had their binoculars and all this kind of thing. And they said, oh, we're on a tour of botanical gardens. And they came and they, somebody said, oh, we've got visitors that need to talk to you. And I was like, oh, you know, what are they going to complain about? But no, they wanted to tell us that they think most of the botanical gardens should be designed like ours. And I said, well, what do you mean? And they said, well, you have left a lot of the native plants. And they said, many of the botanical gardens we go to, they start with a clean slate, a rare piece of land, and they come in and plant all these different um, um, gardens. And they said, because you have left what is here naturally, they said, most gardens we go to, we don't even see or hear a single bird. And they started rattling off the birds that they had seen at the botanical garden. And so, so there is value to this. There is value to letting people walk through a natural setting. And, uh, you know, we have people that come out every day. And now there's a lot of research showing that time spent outdoors, whether it's in a park or a garden, uh, is good for you, good for your health, good for your mental health. Uh, it's, and it's part of a wellness program. And doctors now are beginning to prescribe time outdoors. There's research now that shows that 20 minutes outdoors can reduce your anxiety and stress um, and that kind of thing. So uh, that's something that's important. Of course, the garden does serve as an outdoor classroom. Uh, here's a pruning workshop. You know, we work with extension service quite a bit. And this was a workshop for adults on pruning blueberry bushes. And it's also a great workshop, or excuse me, outdoor classroom for kids. Uh, the Master Gardeners help us teach a lot of our programs. And, you know, what we're teaching is a lifelong hobby. You know, and, and it's well known that if you can get a kid to grow a particular food, he'll eat it. You know, if a kid grows squash, he'll eat squash. You know, if a kid grows kale, he'll eat kale. And so we do several programs out there. We do have uh, the months of September, October, and November, there'll be a special kids program in the demonstration garden every, every month. Well, and I'm sure a lot of you know that we are a site for weddings. Uh, COVID kind of took care of that for us. Um, we basically lost all our rental business, you know, during the pandemic, but we hope it will come back. Um, I know y'all are aware of the Ricketts Hall and because of your picnics and that kind of thing, but it is a great place for wedding receptions or um, uh, events and activities. Uh, this is a rose show that was held two years ago. So it's a great, great gathering place for the community for all kinds of things. We do have scarecrows in the garden coming up, which is a favorite. We have families that have kids in college that still come back for scarecrows because they grew up as kids going to see the scarecrows and they want to come back. So uh, it's not too late. It starts in October. If you or your business or your church or your group wants to enter a scarecrow into the scarecrows in the garden is not not too late to do that this year the theme is every day is a holiday and there is a website i'm sorry i don't have it with me uh, but you can go on, online to our website there's a there's a website you can go to that lists all the different holidays there's over 1500 recognized holidays and so uh, it's we're looking forward to seeing what people can choose. The uh, Ralph Smith Memorial Golf Tournament is coming up and you've got a brochure on your table and I encourage you to participate, you or your business, or you individually. We encourage that. That is one of our major fundraisers for the garden. And whether you're a golfer or not, uh, there is a way that you can contribute and become in the category Friends of Ralph Smith. And um, I don't know if Ralph was Ralph in this club. You know, Ralph loved the garden and his family had done wonderful things for us. And this is a great way to, to pay tribute to Ralph and his support of our community as well as, as the garden. It won't be long before we have to start 
for the Christmas lights. Uh, this, is, this is a huge project. Our Gardens of Glow, which will be every Friday and Saturday night from Thanksgiving to Christmas, um, or through Christmas Eve, I should say. Uh, we will start on that. We encourage folks to, to come and enjoy the gardens. It is a walking uh, adventure through the through the gardens, and it's a it's a really amazing thing. Of course, we do have our annual plant sale in the spring, which is also another fundraiser for us. And we have a new activity that we'll also do in the spring called Egg Quest. We have different four foot eggs scattered throughout the garden in different schools, uh, different individual artists in the community, different churches and different groups, paint Easter eggs and scatter them through the garden. But let's talk about the things that have changed, the things that are new uh, for the garden. One that I'm sure you're aware of, there is now an admission fee to get in the garden for 25 something years, it was free. And we just could no longer afford to do what we do for free. There are free public gardens in the nation, but they're all pretty much sponsored or underwritten by cities or universities or sugar daddies. Um, <laughs> and so we have a very modest admission. Kids 15 and younger get in free. Uh, members, garden members get in free. But if you're 16 or older, we ask for a $5 fee to get in. So, um, and again, um, we hated to do that, but it's something that we had to do. It is very expensive to run a botanical garden. That grass does not cut itself. And so that is something we had to do. But we did, to offset that, we participate in the Connect Pass program through the library. So if that $5 fee is a problem, all they have to do is carry their library card to the downtown library, and they can get a pass that will allow them into the garden. So uh, there's a limited number of these every month, but people do use them, and it is a way that, that we're not keeping anybody out by charging this admission fee. One of the charges that the board gave me was to raise visibility of the garden. Uh, thanks to Wiregrass Foundation and Durden Outdoor, we now have billboards scattered throughout the town. You may have seen these. Uh, we also now have them in some of the surrounding towns. So um, we appreciate their support for that. One of the other things that we're doing now is we have a focus, a new focus on native plants. Uh, we're going to start bringing in more natives. And there are really beautiful, beautiful native plants that you just don't see. You know, they're just not as readily accessible in local nurseries. Uh, but they are adapted to our area. And so you're going to see us bringing in more native plants. These are pitcher plants. Um, South Alabama and Northwest Florida is the center of the universe for, for coniferous plants, pitcher plants. Uh, there are some pitcher plants that are found in Alabama that are found nowhere else in the world. And so people come to Alabama to see these. So um, it's part of our natural heritage and something that we are going to put more emphasis on. If you don't know about pitcher plants, basically the leaf is formed a tube and the plant has a, it'll collect rainwater and it puts out a pheromone and insects land on the lip of that and fall down in it and they can't get out. And so that's where the plant gets its nitrogen. It's a carnivorous plant, just like a Venus flytrap and other types. So, um, but they're very unique and very, Common, I won't say, shouldn't say common, but uh, there are a lot that are found in Alabama that, that are worth educating the public about. You may know about our picnic shelter. This was done really right before I arrived. And so now we can have birthday parties and family reunions and, and that kind of thing. So uh, we're proud to, to have it. We've also focused on visitor services. Uh, we now, again, thanks to Wiregrass Foundation, have directional signage in the garden. Uh, we have reconfigured our parking lot, and there are other things that we're going to do, one of which is we will soon be putting up a lot of educational signs so that you can learn about carnivorous plants or you can learn about day lilies and not just see them, but learn something about them. So we'll be putting up a lot of educational signs 
uh, in the near future. We're also doing things in the garden that we haven't done before, like concerts. Uh, we had to unfortunately cancel um, our concert early in the summer because of rain. Just But we're doing uh, concerts in the, in the garden. The Army National Guard has performed before. Last year we had to cancel it because of COVID, but uh, we will continue to, to do more of those. Uh, we're even doing yoga in the gardens. Uh, the wedding garden is a nice kind of seclude, secluded part of the garden where people can do that. We'll be doing that once a month. We'll have an 8.30 class and a 5.30 class. And the folks that have done it uh, really enjoy it. Testing. Thank you. I'll keep talking. Uh, we now are getting state funds. We are very proud to receive a state allocation. Uh, I don't know if Paul is here today, but Paul Lee and other members of our local legislative delegation have enabled us to get into the state budget, which is helping us in our, our operations. Obviously, I need to tell the photographer to count to three before they take the picture next time. I didn't <laughs> suck in my belly. So, uh, <laughs> One of the biggest changes, though, is that we have finally created a horticulture department. Uh, we only had two full-time employees, myself and the office manager, and we have a part-time worker that mows grass, and we have volunteers, but we have always needed a horticulture department, people with training and background and knowledge about ornamental horticulture. And we now have the beginnings of a department Fellow on the right is Josh Cook, who is from Wicksburg. He recently graduated from Auburn with a master's in horticulture. And then to his right is Caitlin Clark, who is a master gardener and also has a degree. She knows more about herbs than anybody would ever want to know. And so, uh, so they, they're not full-time. They're both part-time, but it is a start. And so we will begin to be able to do things more than just cut the grass. As far as the future, uh, some things that I would like to see. Uh, one is I'd like for us to consider recreating a longleaf pine wiregrass habitat, if we can get some land uh, next to us. Um, you know, this, the, the diversity in a, in a longleaf pine area is unbelievable. It ranks up there with the rainforest. Actually, it's right behind the rainforest. And, um, this is what the early settlers saw when they came to our area. Nobody really understood the biological diversity of, of, um, of this habitat. It's pretty much all gone. It's 98% gone. There's about 2% left. And it stretched from South Virginia all the way to East Texas. And it's gone because of development and the lack of fire. It's a fire dependent ecosystem. And, um, it really has a story to tell as far as plant life. So um, if we can get some adjacent property, that's something I hope we can do in the future. I hope we can put a bridge in. It won't be this nice. But um, we have 15 acres on the other side of the creek. There's a creek that flows through our property. And there's 15 acres on the other side that are unusable because we have no access. So hopefully one day we'll be able to put in some type of boardwalk or bridge and can create a new or additional trail system on the other side of our property. Something we're working on right now, this is not for sure, but we have a, a consultant that's working with us on this, um, and that is to put in a seasonal butterfly house. And so um, this is not a Callaway Gardens style butterfly house. Uh, this is a screen structure. Um, they are popular. A lot of places have them. You basically plant all your nectar plants and host plants, and you put a screen over it, and then you purchase butterflies and release them. And it becomes a living habitat. And, you know, people that don't like bugs like butterflies. And so what we're hoping is that this becomes a, a draw to the garden. Our consultant on this is... Harvey Cotton, if any of you know Harvey or heard of Harvey, 
He is uh, the former director of the Huntsville Botanical Garden, and he built the largest one in the country at the Huntsville Garden. If you're ever up there, it's worth, worth a visit. But um, the board has not decided for sure on that. We're still in the feasibility stage, but we're hoping that that's something that, that we can do. Um, I, feel, I feel certain that when COVID's over, we'll be able to attract schools and, and visitors and that kind of thing. So that's something that we're, we're looking at. Okay. Uh, but whatever we do, it does take volunteers. And we are indebted to our volunteers. The, again, the garden is here because not only of volunteers, but because of the generous support of the business community. Uh, the support of a lot of you, I'm sure some of you are members, uh, but it takes the, the getting on your knees and pulling weeds and, and getting your hands dirty and that kind of thing. So that will always be a big factor in the garden is volunteerism. And I hope that you'll consider supporting us in some way, whether it's through the golf tournament or through membership, there's some membership applications on your table um, or becoming a volunteer. There's a lot of ways that you can support the garden. And one thing I didn't mention is that there's only five public gardens in the state. And Dothan's lucky to have one of them. Matter of fact, people in Montgomery are pitching a fit. They're saying, well, how can Dothan have one? And we don't have one. So there's a group in Montgomery trying to build a botanical garden. But um, again, it's something that I think we um, can be proud of as a community. And uh, again, we're drawing people from 44 states. So. But again, I just encourage you to come out and visit, uh, be a part of what we're doing. And again, I know y'all have your spring picnic out there and I hope you'll come back in the spring and hope that you'll join us in our effort to build a great botanical garden. Thank you all. Any questions? Thank you very much. Truly do have something to be proud of with the botanical garden. I like the um, Christmas lights and I like the scarecrows. I don't like bugs, <laughs> but I like them. <laughs> but thank you. That was that was very interesting. All right. So next week we won't meet. The week after that, Melanie Hill will be our speaker. So we're excited to have her come in. And I uh, want to thank. Uh, Josh for setting up our Zoom and thank you for attending. If you're with us via Zoom, thank you to all our guests that were here. We appreciate it. And uh, let's do our four way test. So, of all the things that we think, say, or do, is it the truth? Is it fair, fair to all concerned? concerned? Will it be goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Thank you.